Aloha from Kona, Hawaii, the Ironman World Championships, um, Racing for Recovery podcast. I am with, what's the introduction I want to do? I am with a, an awesome dude, a sober guy, an Ironman guy, and ironically, my coach, who actually helped me to get to this beautiful island again. Rob, how are you, buddy? I'm doing well, Todd. How are you? I'm good. Good. Better do well on Saturday. Or, or else. <laughs> or else. <laughs> Make me look good. Right. No, you are good, buddy. Um, let, let's, start, let's start with this. How did, how did we get to this table with respect to you helping me get here? Because that's kind of an interesting story, if you will. I think it started in 2008, 2007-ish. I was given your contact information through my coach at the time, uh, knowing that I was in recovery. And my coach told me, hey, it looks like this guy's doing some pretty cool stuff. You should connect with him. So I reached out to you. Uh, we talked a little bit about nonprofit development, so on and so forth, some of the struggles that you were having and some of the things that I had in my background um, in terms of working with nonprofit, so on and so forth. And uh, we connected. We seemed to hit it off. Uh, we stayed in touch. We gave some uh, advice and or uh, suggestions for each other, both uh, as athletes, you more to me as an athlete at the time, and me to you as a nonprofit uh, consultant at the time. We embarked on some strategic planning in around 2008, I believe. Um, you flew out to California. Uh, we came up with a, a plan, five-year plan, all kinds of ideas, so on and so forth. A lot that required, uh, uh, we knew it was going to take some time and uh, a lot of due diligence. And uh, oddly enough, here we are 10 years later, 11 years later, all those things have come to fruition because of your work and dedication to racing to recovery, racing for recovery, my bad. And um, uh, somehow during that time, I dove deeper and deeper and deeper into racing and triathlon and physiology, so on and so forth, and uh, took on the role of a coach. I, in the meantime, in 2014, I quit my paying job, clinical psychologist and uh, system, uh, behavioral health care system. Uh, development, implementation, and oversight, and uh, decided to coach full time. Here we are. We have a lot in common. It's actually the the interchanging of service to one another has changed a few times. From hey, I know some stuff about triathlon. Here you go. You know some stuff about AOD treatment. Here you go to me, and. Here we are, and some of that stuff is, like you said, it's come to fruition, and it's reversed. Funny. The best piece of triathlon advice I ever had was from you in 2010, I think, when I said, hey, you got any words of wisdom? He said, yeah, mile 80 when you want to quit. Tell yourself, what the heck? You've been training for a year. What are you going to do, quit? Yeah. Just keep pedaling. Best thing that I was ever told. Uh, and right back at you with uh god i am just really having a i guess nostalgia moment it, it goes back to everything we talk about at racing for recovery consistency and perseverance and dedication everything that it takes to sustain sobriety when you apply it to whatever you want to do in life's purpose it it gets there it's like what are you going to do quit and the answer to that is no yeah. and with due time and support um things happen so what's your favorite motley crew song Live wire. Right. You know how cool it is to be able to have everything that we have in common with and also a bond and for Motley Crew, you know? You saw those guys back when they were starting, right? I actually um, met those guys when, wow, we were young. I think I was 18. Nikki was probably 19. I met Nikki and Tommy at a Halloween party in Calgary, Alberta for the first time. And uh, uh, we did some damage and I would run into them periodically over the years. And then when I moved from Canada to Los Angeles down in the heart of the scene, we uh, ran into each other several, several times over the years, got to be casual 
friends right. once in a while. Um, yeah, we we got into a lot of trouble together. And then I know now, uh, I think he's coming up on 18 years sober or something. Uh, great to see. Um, I He's a great example of somebody who's been able to leverage his celebrity to really facilitate some real positive change in substance use and mental health and, and, and run away and a ton of uh, social issues. Um, and he is very passionate about it. Uh, and I love him about it. He's love him or hate him. The guy has done amazing, although he still hasn't topped the first Motley Crue album. Right, right, right. I think of a lot of this stuff, even this conversation, some people could be going, oh, God, they're talking about Motley Crue. What does this have to do with sobriety? And to me, it had everything to do with it. It's like the things you did in the dark days now can be enjoyed fully in, in the good days. And music certainly is one of those things. I mean, you listen to them now, it's just a totally different mindset. There's gratitude in there. There's humility in there. There's empathy for the people that are still doing it. And you mentioned um, the whole celebrity thing. And I, I, I know both of us come from, you know, receiving help from another format, which is great. But the anonymity part of that is, profound I guess is a word and I, I I respect that but on the other side of it if you don't talk about it how are you going to connect with other like-minded people and that's not a slag of another concept I'm just trying to do something different it's like I I figure people ought to share that success that they've had so someone else can look at it and go wow if that guy can do it then I there's hope for me too right yeah I think it's a very noble gesture when you're in that type of situation um, that is a celebrity it's very noble to be able to do things under the radar and, you know, you want to take your ego out of it and not appear to be doing things for the wrong reasons in the media and whatnot. I get it, but I really truly believe that you're limiting the amount of change that you have the potential to facilitate if you don't attach your celebrity to something. Yeah. I've recently worked with a couple other celebrities that, that we've talked about that that used to take that more uh, – uh, a lower profile approach to things that they would do in the community. But once they started putting their name behind it, they started to see some growing and some real leverageable, sustainable, very impactful change uh, just for the fact that their name was now behind something. I mean, face it, you know, people who have a following, they have the potential to lead a lot of pe folks one way or the other. So why not use that for good? 100%. So let's talk about your awesome knowledge and experience with coaching for a minute because I'm always honest with what I'm doing. I remember, you know, I've watched you ha have the success you've had and I'm like, man, my guy's, my guy's doing it. And I've had some, I've had some problems with this stuff over the years physically. I've never claimed to have been some awesome triathlete. I find a way to, to cross the finish line in a few events, but being good at this, that's not in the conversation when it comes to me. And I remember thinking, I got to change some things here just on a health aspect. And I was looking at you and I'm like, I know I should reach out to Rob, but for some reason I'm like, I, I don't know if I should. I think it was some fear of, I didn't know how you'd, how you'd receive me contacting you and asking for help. And this is, it's interesting because I should have known how you'd respond to it but it's back to that self-esteem stuff of, you know, I'm not good enough. I don't want to waste this guy's time and all that stuff. So first and foremost, I appreciate everything you've done for me for over a year. It's been probably 15, 16 months, but I guess talk about not only your coaching services, but what was it like to have me reach out to you and just ask for help on that level? I'll start with the latter part of that first. For, uh, it was awesome to have you reach out to me. I look at it much the same way I look out somebody who reaches out to me for help with substance use or mental health. Uh, I am a huge advocate for health and wellness. Um, I'm even a bigger advocate for health and wellness within the recovery community. There are, there's a ton of research and literature that, that backs and verifies and outlines the uh, positive impact that exercise of any way, shape, or form can have on people in recovery, early recovery, long-term recovery, it doesn't matter. Um, at the end of the day, it's about neurochemistry and brain science. And exercise facilitates and stimulates good 
neuroscience. Right. So um, when we look at the impact that that has, most people that abuse substances are looking for something in particular. They're looking to feel a certain way to remove the way they feel. Exercise is one of the best, healthiest ways to do that. So I'm always on board and I will always help whoever I can in that respect. I have some of my coaches who get, my one of my, my managers who just left me actually, uh, gets very upset with me because I give my stuff away. Because I'm very passionate about it and I look at it as, as, as helping. Um, from a coaching perspective, I look at everything with the overarching ideal of health, health and wellness to the individual. And whatever I do performance-wise as a coach has to fit underneath that. In other words, I'm not going to sacrifice a performance goal for anybody's long-term health and wellness. So we talk about the, the proper order of things where exercise or triathlon in this case fits into the hierarchy of what is their life. Most of us, if we're not professionals, we have families, jobs, and other interests, you know, and a host of other things. And exercise has to fit in its proper place within that. When I first started coaching, I had a, a woman come up to me at a Christmas party that we were having. And she said, she said to me, um, well, I can't have my daughter I can't I can't attend a certain function because I have to look after my daughter because my husband has a long ride that day you have him scheduled for a long ride and I said excuse me she says yeah he's gonna miss her Christmas play and I said no he's not that's not cool to me so those types of things and looking from a coaching perspective I think it's important to understand the athlete the athlete's life and the context in which training or triathlon or whatever the gig is fits within that. With you, you already have a pretty profound sense of that. And I know where your heart and soul lies, you know, with Racing for Recovery uh, first and your family. Like I, the, one of the things I've loved seeing on a side note here more than anything is I love watching you and your wife and your kids and seeing the evolution that that has taken on over the years because like most of us we've had some ups and downs and everything else for well the reasons don't even matter but um to watch the love that you have for your kids and that they have for you and your wife and your family i think that's first and foremost for anybody that i coach and uh, it just makes my heart sore um from a pure coaching and physiology perspective, I've been really blessed to have been taught by, trained alongside, and learned from the best triathletes in the world. You know, Craig Alexander, Marinda Carfrey, Siri Lindley, Rebecca Keat, Aaron Carson. I mean, it goes Matt Corey, you know, on and on and on. Um, and I don't know how or why the universe put me in those situations, but they did. And I've used it as opportunity to expand my knowledge base and carry that to the athletes that I work with. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to watch people accomplish. It's, it's like a metaphor for recovery mm-hmm. to, to go beyond what they thought they could do. And they have a goal, and I don't want to help them meet that goal. I want to help them exceed that goal and help them understand that truly in anything is possible. Mm-hmm. I love the tagline, the Iron Man tagline, for that reason. Um, so it's just like, for me, it holds, it's like a metaphor for as a clinician, I would be able to, when I was doing direct service work, um, when something didn't go right, the patient would wind up, you know, incarcerating, losing children, losing a job, losing a home, sometimes dying from, you know, this horrid disease, so on and so forth in triathlon or as a coach. If we fall short of the goals and benchmarks we don't set, we get to pick another race. So selfishly, <laughs> for me, I get all the upside of watching people achieve things they never thought that they could do without the downside. You know, you mentioned this earlier, and it's the, one of the things I've uh, loved about you and admired about you the most is 
it's always family first. You're, you're one of the first ones who comments on some of the pictures of Melissa and I or the kids and saying it's so good to see that first. And you also have an understanding of, you know, I have a lot of my time is occupied with them and then with Racing for Recovery. So I, I can imagine, I'm trying to be you for a second. It has to be uh, frustrating from a lack of a better term, and it shows still areas of my life I need to improve upon, which I, I know that. I know you have something that I don't. It's the knowledge and experience in some of this stuff, and I still find my way uh, of saying, not saying you don't know what you're talking about. I justify why I'm not doing things to the fullest. A lot of times it's legit when my body is like, I don't have it. But there's other times where it's like, well, I've done this and I, I, I am doing my best to, to change that. At times I have mm -hmm. and other times I, I, I fail at it, to, to be perfectly honest. And the reason I'm talking about this is I think a lot of people look at the enormity of Iron Man and initially they think I can't. And I, I want to talk to you now about how I guess the lack of volume that I do and I'm still able to... Uh, finish some of these things and make that relatable to somebody who's looking at Iron Man and thinking I can't and then relating it to him on a time perspective of yes you can yes yeah, so um, a couple of things so generally what happens is the engine outgrows the chassis you know in training we build the aerobic engine that that's the the the, the backbone of what we do what happens if we don't take care of the chassis over the years, i.e. the bones and the muscles and the structure in which the aerobic, you know, engine is built, it, it breaks down and we get injured. And especially as we get older and we race more or we train more, it's, it's going to happen. Um, so I think that when we look, we look, we, we, we build the engine uh, there is volume, you, you know, at some point in time, Iron Man's going to have a conversation with you and you'd better be ready to have that conversation or it's going to whoop you. I mean, you know that as well as anybody, right? You're a, a rarity, right? In that you're not afraid to hurt. And this is one of the things, one of the draws for people in recovery and endurance sports, because it's the pain that's really the hook. Uh, we've substituted, we, it's those long, dark days out there training when there's co having conversations with ourself in the universe, uh, whether the conversations are self-deprecation or enlightenment and discovery or whatever they are, that's part of the hook and the reason why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. The other thing, of course, is endorphins and kephalons and like we talked about before, neurochemistry. But uh, if I work with an athlete who is time crunched, yeah, we don't need 20 hours a week to dedicate to training. Some people do. Some people want. And some people don't, right? Right dose, right athlete, right time. And it's my job to know when to apply what to whom. Uh, with you, because you are not afraid to hurt, you can go by. You're one of the mentally, mentally you're one of the toughest people I know because you will take that, that suck so to speak, that pain when it comes, and you'll push it aside and you'll go to those, you're not afraid to go to those places between your ears during the day. You know what you're in for. Um, some people are willing to go there, some people aren't. So the people that aren't, we better have some volume in there because they're not prepared to hurt that way. Mm. So yeah, um, it's, a f it's really fun and that's the art to me. That's the art, the science is easy, right? The science in this stuff is easy. You, you, you learn, you read, you study, so on and so forth. Right dose, right person at the right time. That's the art of coaching. And that's what I love about it is putting those two things together. Anybody can do the science. It's easy. Anybody can finish Iron Man. Show up and train. Train, 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 train. If you have the what I refer to as testicular fortitude or mental fortitude to be able to to hang with that kind of volume. You know, and everything you're saying right there, it's so applicable to sobriety and that's that's why a lot of people, I don't think they, they understand, uh, you know, personally why I've been doing these, these things. It's, I, I'm trying to equate it to what it takes to be sober because it's the same thing. Are you, what are you willing to do to sustain not only sobriety, but improve it? Yeah. 
And it's the same thing with, with training. You know, as you said, how far are you willing to go when it, when it hurts? Cause it's going to hurt. You're going to go through emotional hardships. You know, you and I both have done that several times, you know, it's like, I'm not going to use drugs over it. What, what am I going to learn from this? And in the process of that learning, what do I utilize to just enhance this difficult time? And, you know, every Ironman race is applicable to that, especially this one, you know, this is, you know, it's no, it's no joke out there, you know? And I, I think another reason why I'm asking you this stuff is, is it's to find, I don't, I don't know if there are faults in what I'm doing. Um, I guess I could take faults, but it's more of, uh, as you said, what, what works for that individual because it's different. I don't want to, I don't want to spend 20 hours a week training. I don't want to do that to increase an hour on my time when I got to not be around my kids as much or whatever, you know, um, let me, I do want to ask you this. Would you say the schedule that I've had for 2019, is that normal? Yeah. Uh, well, for some people, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So it's not uncommon. And look, be, let's be, let's be perfectly clear. When I put you down for a five hour ride, I know you're not going to ride five hours. I just know that that's not in your DNA. So I know I'll put you down for a five hour ride, hoping that I'll get three out of you, yep. you know, and I'm always going to program for a best case scenario, you know, or this is kind of what we're going to go after here. Um, and I will always program for any athlete as a best case scenario. Once I get to know the athlete, you know, for some athletes, that best case scenario might be, I need to hold them back so that they're not, they, they don't go out and ride 140 miles, you know, or they're not going to ride a, a base session at, at tempo or threshold or steady state, you know, those types of things. Um, right dose, right athlete, right time. Right. <laughs> what, there's a question I've, I've never really asked anybody, but h how is this finding another one of your purposes in life? How has it built your self-esteem? Great question. Um, I try to remove myself from the equation. I've done a lot of soul searching over the last year or so myself due to some things in my personal life. Uh, and I've really gotten knee deep into back into trusting the process and, and trying to remove myself from any kind of ambition or anticipated outcome. And when I do that, my life is wonderful when I approach training like that as a coach and encourage my athletes not to worry about time and don't think about a result, let's just get that out of the equation and stay married to the process, the process of training, the process of on race day, one step, one pedal stroke, one swim stroke at a time, they have their best results. We, we, we put tape over the Garmin or we leave the Garmin at home in training on race day. You surely don't need to be looking at it. You know, those types of things you learn to race by perceived exertion. You know, when you're in zone two, you know, when you're in zone four, you know, when you need to pull back part of that's experience and that comes with, with training that way. But I swear staying married to the process every time has yielded the best results. What was it like yesterday when I introduced you to, uh, the, uh, I call them the awesome success stories of racing for recovery. And we had lunch, you know, and you came up and met everybody. What, what was going through your, your mind when you were just talking to everybody? First thing I thought was, darn, he's got a whole posse here. <laughs> it I takes it was a team, awesome. Rob. I'm right? old. I, I, I hear you. <laughs> if you take, some, take a village, it takes me in an entire city. Uh, I thought it was great. And um, such a good vibe, such nice people. Yeah. Um, and sitting down and, and one of the first things I said was, so tell me about racing for recovery. Tell me about your experience. Cause you have a group of people with a lot of different lenses, mm -hmm. right. in their roles here or as consumers and, or, you know, with their involvement with the organization. So I want to hear all the perspectives, right. Um, through those different lenses. And, and I mean, it's kind of a metaphor for life, right. So in general, was it, did you hear anything that you, you learned from or that surprised you or validated some of our conversations previously about what we were trying to do with this whole thing. I, yeah. So I think that, uh, I have to keep my mind open to always be learning and the people that I can learn the most from oftentimes are the people that are newer in recovery. Yeah. 
and I did learn a few things from the people that I had talked about and just listening to their, you know, their, their struggles and their plight and coming in and coming to you and having the success that they're having now. I mean, to me, you know, we get sober. One of the things that I hear all the time is, oh, we get sober so that we can be happy. No, I got sober so that I can be useful. Because mm. for me, happiness is a product of being useful to others. Yeah. And I know that that's what you have built your life on. You, that's what you built Racing for Recovery on is being of maximum service to, to people around you, you know, to the universe and the people around you. And that's my primary purpose as well. You know, I, when you were talking you were sitting at the other end of the table and i heard you talking to a couple people and aj who was on last week's podcast he he leaned over to me and he said are, are you are you listening to this right now and i'm like yeah and it's just another thing of like having your purpose in life come to fruition where you just step back and go yeah i'm finding whatever i was doing for myself is now able to serve somebody else and that's the that's the ticket, whether it's coaching, you know, mentoring somebody educationally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, what have you. It's giving back, right? Yeah, absolutely. I still do. You know, I still have my foot in the clinical pond. I still do some some therapeutic work with a select number of folks. Uh, <clears throat> people often say to me, oh, so you're a coach now, so you don't do clinical work anymore? Or you don't practice psychology anymore? And I, and I have to laugh, right? Because we're the most broken people there are. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, we're the most broken people around. So I actually say, actually, I do more psychology now than I've ever done. <laughs> right. A lot of it on self in the mirror, right? <laughs> but I did, um, I did look. At, I did have a great conversation with um, uh, one of your one of your community members yesterday, and uh, he was shocked when he said, "Oh, you're in recovery," and I just assumed that everybody knows that yeah. you know and i said well well yeah i am and he goes oh and, the, and then the conversation took on a completely different flavor at that point and uh was much uh it seemed a little more relaxed well so. the relatability factor whether you're coaching or counseling somebody with drug and alcohol addiction you you better have some experience with this i mean if you've never done an iron man with all due respect how do you really coach one you know i'm sure I'm sure there's people that do that and that's fine, yeah. but it's like, I, if you don't know what that's like to be out there, how, how do you help me do that? You know? Well, you know, like I said, the, the science is the science. That's easy, but the art. That's true. What, um, plug your coaching stuff. What do you, how can racing for recovery help you get more people like us into your stuff? Cause I'm looking at how we do more partnering next year and bringing people together through what you're doing. Awesome. Yeah, so I, um, I'm i very recovery friendly with what I do coaching wise. I own a brick and mortar in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, with a <coughs> full on training facility. We have a 15 rider indoor cycling studio, a run lab, about a dozen uh, treadmills of all different kinds in there, some for injury rehab, some for straight performance, some more traditional treadmills, so on and so forth. We have a TRX studio, strength and conditioning studio, recovery lounge, blah, blah, blah all kinds of stuff. We have a wonderful space that I use for a playground for my athletes. And I also open up membership for other people to come in, other endurance athletes to come in and train. I'm very recovery centric in that anybody in the recovery community, I bring in either a pro bono mm -hmm. or um, a discounted rate to come in and train for coaching and remote services you know, for like we talked about before, for racing for recovery members, you get a huge, ginormous discount. Um, I, I basically give my stuff away f to recovery people, and I'm, I take a great amount of satisfaction in taking the recovery community on um, as a coach because of the benefits that it pays for people in recovery, like we talked about earlier. And that's why we're friends. Mm -hmm. What? Do, how do people get a hold of you? You know, someone watching this right now who knows of racing for recovery or hopefully when you share this they don't know of us but are you know like-minded like us how, how do they get a hold of you and what are they going to get from you well they can get a hold of me at uh tractiveendurance.com and at the bottom of our lousy website is a contact us uh you can shoot me an email or a phone number at rob at tractiveendurance.com or my phone number is on there as well um, and we can go from there. I'm always open to conversations and see what makes sense. I, upon first interaction with people, I, it's your opportunity to interview me 
not the other way around because right. the most important thing is f fit, right? You have to be comfortable with me and I, um, and I with you. But you are the consumer, um, regardless of, you know, any kind of monetary or exchange or what have you. Uh, I don't want anybody to be someplace where they don't feel that they're going to flourish or maximize the return. Right on. Right. So, yeah. By the way, uh, the people that are doing this podcast right now, they do websites. So Flanders Creatives, who are out here in lovely Hawaii with us uh, as a part of the team that you referred to, um, they can help you out with that website. They enhance the Racing for Recovery website tremendously. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sold. Uh, I ask this of every time I'm doing a, a podcast and we're about to wrap up. Is there anything you want to ask me or say to me? You know, I think, I often think in my heart of hearts that if the world had more people like yourself in it, it would be a better place. The, the level of altruism that you exemplify every single day and your belief and your passion in the mission and the work that you do at Racing for Recovery floors me. The way that you approach your family, my, one of my favorite social media things I've ever seen. So I'm the guy that like looks at the baby giraffes and the cat, you know, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, there was a photo on there a couple of years ago that you had put on there and I'm almost going to get teary even thinking about it. When you raced an Ironman in Australia and your daughter met you at the finish line. And I'm not quite sure what it is about that photo. But it's one of the few instances when I look at a photograph on a computer and the energy and the feeling that emotes from that photograph and the energy between you and your daughter in that photograph just makes my heart sore. And I mean sore, like take off to the heavens sore, not hurt sore. Because there's something about that photograph that just says love wow. in its purest form. And that is what it's all about, you know? And looking at the joy and the gratitude on your face and and her admiration of you in that photo. There's so many things that just pop out at it. And there are others too, but that one, man, is something. And I think that pretty much sums up, to me, your spirit and who you are in that one photo. I'm, I'm touched by that, Rob. I, I appreciate that. I, I, know the, I know the photo you're talking about with Skylar, and it's, um, I know you'll relate to this. Uh, you know, that was when our family started to heal. Uh, that was 2015. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this, yeah. whatever, I think it's relative, but we, we struggled a lot of the thing. I, I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. I didn't see the impact of some of the things I was pursuing, which for people like us, that's when we find a, a purpose, it's hard to not pursue. I didn't see what it, the toll it was taking on Melissa and the kids. And, you know, we had turned things around in 2014, and then Skyler and I went to Melbourne, Australia for that race. And, you know, Iron Man filmed a couple of things, and they, they had her at the finish. I was not, I wasn't expecting that. And uh, I always say this, I'm so thankful I had sunglasses on because I was just losing it. And that picture, it's, a, as you said, it exemplifies, um, God, healing, uh, love, faith, uh, perseverance, commitment, understanding, compassion for self, for others, you know, and uh, just hearing you describe that, it's like, huh, that's one of the kindest things I think that anybody's ever, ever said to me. And I will be using that on Saturday for sure. I was just going to say, you that's, know, that's what you need to put in your hip pocket on Saturday. I'm, I'm bummed that they're not, that they're not out here. It's tough because, you know, Skyler, you know, she's over in, uh, uh, at college, finishing her senior year, my son's a freshman in Bowling Green University. My two younger ones are doing stuff, and it's like, this is such a big event 
But in the big scheme of things, it doesn't mean anything. That's right. You know what I mean? It means nothing. And, and, and that sums up triathlon, really. Right. Right? I yeah. mean, it's a metaphor for so many things, but in the grand scheme of things. It's who cares? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, hearing that, it's like those, those are the things that you were talking about this earlier and they're applicable to recovery again when it hurts out there. And I know it's going to hurt Saturday. I'll think of this conversation and literally I'll say to myself, look, man, it's another five hours, five hours for an investment for the rest of your life. I mean, come on. It's not that big of a deal. And that is what people need to know when they're thinking about using again or I can't go on. It's like this is a blip in the proverbial scheme of life. And when people can really utilize that mindset, you can overcome anything, anything, not just an Ironman, but life, you know? Yep, I do. One question I do have, what's next for Racing for Recovery? That's a great question. Well, one thing I definitely... And I'm not going to say I want, we will implement some sort of coaching thing for 2020. So notice the verbiage in there. Not I hope to, it's we will have that. So I'm going to need your help on that because I'm not versed in it. What's next for Racing for Recovery is to continue growing this podcast. um, I'm so proud of the fact that our not only our cutting edge support group meeting format that combines everybody who's been affected by addiction, but the fact that that is now offered free on a live global uh, broadcasting live stream every week, that stuff is remarkable. Hiring people. You know, I, I interviewed, like I said, I interviewed AJ. He was the first person I wrote a Racing for Recovery paycheck to. And I remember calling my dad and saying, I made it. Hmm. I made it by writing one check. I could have walked away from all of this and said, I did it. You know, so to me, it's doing more of what we're currently doing, Um, finding new ways to be better at what we're currently doing, being receptive to people like yourself or anybody else who says, hey, have you thought about this or why don't you try that? I love being an innovator. I don't copy things that are currently out there. I think that's wrong to do. I like uh, marching to our own beat, if you will. But again, being receptive enough to understand there might be two beats instead of one. And I just look for this program growing. I look for more people having conversations with me like you and I are having today. I just, I love what I'm blessed to do, privileged to do, honored to do. And like we know, I just, I want more. Yeah. I want more. I want to get better as an individual first. Um, like you said earlier, we're the ones that need the most work. I truly believe that. And when, when you're willing to do that and not thinking you have this figured out, it brings that humility, as your shirt says, you know. And so I'm just looking for more stuff. I know we'll be back here again. I know more people from Racing for Recovery will experience this and then will take this and apply it to their own recovery. Whether they do an Ironman or they go back to school, they get their kids back. I don't care, you know. It's yep. just I want I want more of what we're fortunate enough to do, and I'm. It, it's I, this whole time I'm talking to you, Rob. I'm like, man, I've known you for let's call it 12 years, and to think back when we, you bought those charts and all these markers, and we were writing these things down, and I'm sitting there looking at this, and I'm like, I know what he's saying intellectually. How how is this going to happen? And then understanding through work, commitment, and all the things we talk about, it happens. You just don't know when. Right? Oh, Stay dude. married to the process. Thanks for being on here today, buddy. Of course, of course. As you're talking, just one last thing. Uh, it, it dawns on me that we're going to need to set something up for some of your members. And we're going to have you and some of your members come out to the Bay Area. Awesome. We'll do a clinical and exercise based camp and training for mind body and spirit that'd be awesome let's do it i'm looking forward to that hey i have one more question i thought of. i want to see if you get this right do you remember the run that you and i did at your house do you know how far that was i do how far it's about 10 miles it was it was 10 miles that's right and the reason i'm bringing that up again about how our roles have switched I was in the best running shape of my life then. Yeah. (laughs) 
I remember thinking when you're like, oh, we'll run 10. I'm like, that, okay. And I felt awesome. And I know, and I, this isn't a criticism. You just, you weren't at that level yet, right? But look where you are now. And now helping me to, if I get back to that level, great. If I don't, that's okay too. But that's another example of just how being teachable and staying humble, how things change and evolve. Because I'm not that guy on, a, on an athletic level, but I know how emotionally distraught I was there, and I'm not that guy either. I love that. That's the point. I absolutely love that. Yeah. yeah. yeah Until fun. next time, Racing for Recovery people, aloha. We'll see you soon.